Greetings, booktubers, and welcome back to Grammaticus Books. And today we're going to be talking about one of the pillars of science fiction, the book that cemented into the science fiction lexicon the very idea of celestial megastructures. We're talking about the one ring to rule them all, the one science fiction ring to rule them all, and that is, of course, Ringworld by Larry Niven, originally published in 1970. Uh, this is 1977 whole press edition. It's a book club edition, a uh, hardback with a really nice vintage cover on it. Uh, the first uh, hardback edition, the very first hardback edition, uh, was published in 1972 in Great Britain. A very limited print run, very hard to get a hold of, very expensive to get a hold of. But if you're not familiar with Ringworld and Larry Niven, Larry Niven, Ringworld is literally a watershed moment in science fiction. It is the first time that a science fiction author with any type of real depth and analysis has posited in a book form uh, this idea of celestial megastructures. And it is just a wonderful idea that has had an enormous influence in science fiction since its first publication in 1970. So what is this megastructure? What is this ring world? It is quite simply put a alien artifice, an alien structure made by unknown aliens at an unknown time, aeons in the past, for an unknown purpose around this far distant star. And it is a ribbon of this constructed material that is 186 million miles in diameter encircling this star. It is roughly the size of Earth's orbit about the sun. Uh, it has retaining walls on it that are over a thousand miles high because the inside is open to, the, to open to space. There's no dome on it at all because the ring rotates at 770 miles per second. So it doesn't need a dome. It uses centrifugal force from this rotation in order to keep the atmosphere inside of it with the retaining walls and to impart it a gravity that is equal to 99.2% of Earth's gravity. So whatever aliens constructed it, they were very similar to, uh, to Earth-like beings to humans. And the inside of it is completely terraformed with uh, mountains, oceans, uh, rivers, forests, you name it but it is so huge that its geologic footprint is roughly equivalent to three million Earths. It is a massive, massive structure. So it's written by this book, it's written in 1970, it's written by Larry Niven. And if you're not familiar with Larry Niven, I'll give you just a brief background on him. Uh, he was born in 1938 in California. Uh, he went initially to California Institute of Technology in order to study mathematics. But while he's there, he discovers a bookstore that has got all these science fiction novels in it. And he becomes so engrossed in science fiction that he ignores his studies and he fails out of CIT after one year. He does eventually go on and he gets a degree in mathematics from Washburn University. And then he starts studying uh, graduate uh, level mathematics uh, at another university, at Caltech, I believe. But he drops out after a year there because in 1964, he publishes his first uh, his first book, his first, I think it was a short story, and he goes just entirely into becoming an author at that point. And then in 1970, he write, writes his most well-known book, which is, of course, Ringworld. Um, his other really well-known works are The Moat in God's Eye, which is a, a book that he co-wrote with Jerry Purnell. A Lucifer Hammer is another one that he and Jerry Purnell co-wrote. And his Man Kazin Wars um, are another very popular series. And the Kazin Wars are going to factor into Ringworld because Ringworld takes place in Larry Niven's known space universe of 2850 AD. So what is the general plot of Ringworld? The general plot is the main character is Louis Wu. Louis Wu is an Earthman. He's on Earth and he's celebrating his 200th birthday. And the reason he's so old is because he's been taking a uh, substance known as booster spice which sounds suspiciously like something contained in another novel that I know. But Louis Wu is 200 years old. He's bored and he's celebrating his birthday on Earth and he's moving ahead of the, uh, of the sunrise to try to keep this day going as long as he can. And as he's moving across the Earth, uh, racing the sun, uh, he gets intercepted by a Pearson puppeteer. And Pearson puppeteers are these very cowardly aliens who are very advanced. And this one is called Nessus, and he's called Nessus the Mad because he's not as cowardly as, as his other Pearson puppeteers, and he will act, actually interact with other aliens, which to Pearson puppeteers makes him insane if he's willing to take those risks. Uh, risks. And he intercepts Louis Wu, and he proposes to Louis Wu to go on this mission uh, to the ring world, and he wants to put together a crew of four individuals. 
And Lewis Wu agrees because he's bored. He's 200 years old and he's bored. And it sounds like a, an adventurous mission. And in addition to that, Nessa says that if he goes with them, he will award the spaceship that they travel there in because it's so far distant, they have to go in a very advanced hypervelocity spaceship that is beyond Earth or Kazin technology. So the spaceship, which is named the Lime Bastard, is gonna be the prize in order to help induce these, uh, these crew members to go with Nessus because Nessus needs a crew because even though he's braver than most Pearson puppeteers, he's still a coward at heart. So Louis Wu agrees and they recruit other members of the crew. They recruit a Kazin warrior diplomat by the name of Speaker to Animals. And he's called Speaker to Animals because the Kazin view every, every species that isn't a Kazin as an animal that is to be killed and eaten. But this one is a diplomat. So it makes him as a Kazin a bit of an outsider as well. So he agrees to try to earn glory uh, in war at the, uh, at the ring roll. That's his motivation for going. Uh, and then the fourth member of the crew is Tila Brown. And Tila Brown is the product of six generations of her forefathers who were able to win the birthright lottery on earth, which was a very rare thing to get. So she has basically been bred for luck. She is, in, in a way, very much like the character Domino, Lady Luck from Deadpool 2, where, where a Deadpool saying, uh, luck isn't a superpower, and no, it is a superpower. And Tila Brown the, exhibits the superpower in a very subtle way, in a very well-written and deft way uh, by Larry Niven throughout the book that, that has some surprising twists to it that you might not see coming. So these are the four characters that have been uh, recruited for this crew. And they have very good different personalities, different motivations for going on this trip that cause them to have uh, these frictions and interactions that make a lot of the plot happen once they arrive at Ringworld. But they get there and predictably things go horribly wrong as soon as they get there. And the rest of the novel is spent uh, of them trying to trek across the surface of Ringworld in order to get to a point where they can repair the line bastard and escape off of it. And that, in a, in, a, in, a, in a nutshell, that is the plot of this book. And it's an excellent book. It's very entertaining. I enjoyed it very much. I originally read this when I was in my 20s, and then I recently reread it. I reread this copy right here uh, just to see if my opinion on it had changed. And it's changed slightly. But before I go into that, I want to talk about the influence that this book has had because the influence has just been tremendous. Ever since it was written in 1970, for the intervening uh, 50 plus years, it's had just a huge impact on science fiction. Uh, from the game Halo, the computer game Halo, the TV series Halo that has taken a, a inspiration from it. You've got the movie Elysium with Matt Damon and a Jodie Foster. Quick aside, that's a terrible movie. If anybody asks you to watch that movie, just say no and save yourself two hours of your life right there. <laughs> Rant over, uh, but back to its influence, uh, the Expanse series of science fiction books, uh, it was definitely influenced by this as well. Its, it's influence is hard to overstate. Uh, it really is hard to overstate just how much of an impact, how much of a watershed moment uh, this book was. So what were the things that I really liked about this book? What I really enjoyed about it is, is this is a big idea book. This is Larry Niven um, positing one of the biggest ideas that come along in science fiction. He does it wonderfully and he grounds it and a fairly realistic set of mathematics and physics that brings it to life in a very good manner. And then he puts this crew together who he's thought out the backgrounds of this crew very carefully. And it really does make for very good personal interactions and a really interesting storytelling throughout the novel that carries the novel once they get to the ring world. What I didn't like about the book, some of the cons of it, is that despite the different motivations and these uh, backgrounds that these characters have, uh, Nessus the Puppeteer, Louis Wu, Tila Brown, and Speaker to Animals, they still come across a bit underdeveloped. I'm not going to call them flat, but I think they come, uh, come, uh, they come across as a bit underdeveloped, like there could have been a lot more. There was a lot more meat on the bone uh, to fleshing out their characters. And the other thing to me that was a little bit of a disappointment is I think, again, there was a lot of meat on the bone for Larry Niven to just take this massive ring world and just run with it in terms of fleshing out the, uh, the cultures, the backgrounds, the interactions, all the beings that are living on it. I think that they could have been done with a, a little bit more uh, interesting and more dynamic 
uh, writing and prose and thought that he could have thrown into it. But despite those cons, I really like this book. I give it two thumbs up. If you haven't read it, uh, it is one of the pillars of science fiction. Uh, it's certainly one of the pillars of the uh, Silver Age of science fiction, um, in my opinion. And it's just a wonderful, wonderful book. The book here, it has this 1977 Holt Press edition. It has a forward by the author that was written in 1970, 1976 for this 1977 publication. And I'm going to read a little bit of it here of Larry Niven's own words about the book. Uh, he says, people seem to want to talk about the ring world. They want to know if Nessus survived or who built the ring world and then study the description or study the opinions of Tila Brown, the gene range from the obvious that it's all hogwash to the subtle that Tila's uh, lifestyle could take on any form save death. They sketch ring worlds with labels across the back, one ring to rule them all. And occupancy by more than three times 10 to the 15 persons is dangerous and unlawful. That was the part I was trying to get to there and kind of stumbled over it. I apologize. Uh, and then he wraps up his, his little letter, letter here, his author's note, uh, with this paragraph. So here I am, seven years later, thinking of bringing Louis Wu and Speaker back to the ring world. I've already signed the contract. I never thought it would happen. In seven years, I've thought of some things that nobody mentioned. Things about the ring world population and details of the rim walls and the great oceans and the location of the control and repair center and the reason the ring world was built in the first place. But these aren't what sparked me to write more on the ring world. I think it must have been all that nagging, nagging, nagging. Thanks, gang. Larry Niven, Tarzana, California, November 18th, 1976. And he got nagged to death by fans to rewrite, uh, write some sequels. There's a very famous incident in uh, 1971, I think it was, right after this came out, that a bunch of MIT students tracked him down and started shouting, the ring road is unstable, the ring road is unstable, because they had done the math on it. And that, I think, was one of the big things that led him to write the, uh, the second book in the series, uh, which is Larry Niven and the Ring World Engineers. Uh, but that's a video for another day. I think that's enough on the Ring World. Hugo Nebula, uh, Dittmar, a uh, Locus Award-winning novel from a uh, science fiction master, a grandmaster of science fiction, and just a wonderful book. Read it if you hadn't had a chance. I would love to hear your thoughts on it. Please put them down in the comments section below. Uh, and with that, I'm going to say take care, be safe, and I'll catch you guys next time.